This is chapter eight on gases, and section four is the relationship between temperature and pressure, known as Gay-Lussac's law. Gay-Lussac's law states that the Kelvin temperature of a gas is directly related to its pressure. So remember to keep in mind that you always need to use the Kelvin uh, temperature scale when you're dealing with gases. But so the Kelvin temperature of a gas is directly related to its pressure, meaning if you increase the temperature, you'll increase the pressure as well. So if you double the temperature from 200 to 400 K, the pressure will double, in this case from one atmosphere to two atmospheres. Uh, and this makes sense if you understand what pressure is, right? Pressure is the force of all those particles bouncing off the walls of the container. So if you heat up the gas, that means the particles all move faster. They move faster, they hit with more force, and they also hit more frequently against the walls. And so all of that is going to serve to increase the pressure that the container feels. Okay, so increase the temperature, increase the pressure. Mathematically, we can say that the quotient P divided by T is constant as long as you are holding the volume and the number of particles fixed. Okay? Uh, and we can express this as a mathematical equation, P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. And again, just like with the previous laws, we're now thinking about this as a gas that's undergoing some change. Uh, you define the pressure and the temperature before the change, and then one of those variables changes and the other will have to change to accommodate that because you're holding V and N constant. So just like with Charles's law, there's two basic question types. Uh, you're generally given the initial pressure and temperature, and then either the final temperature, in which case you're asked to solve for the new pressure, or you're given the new pressure and asked to solve for the new temperature. Okay? And these are the two examples we have here. The algebra here is identical to the case for Charles's law, just with the substitution of pressure for volume. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all the algebra here. If you want a refresher on it, then just go back and review the previous video uh, and just make the substitution where you see V in that equation, you see P here. Okay? Other than that, it's identical. So we can take a look at an example. And in going through this, you should recognize that uh, the, the procedure and the process and even the math and the algebra are very, very similar to what we've done previously with Boyle's Law and Charles's Law. Okay, so to go through it quickly, the problem is a gas has a pressure of two atmospheres at 18 degrees Celsius. What is the new pressure when the temperature is 62 degrees Celsius? And it says you have constant volume in moles. Okay, so there's a few different ways, again, that you should be able to recognize that this is asking you to use Gay-Lussac's law. You have a pressure, okay, an initial pressure and an initial temperature, and then you're asked to find the new pressure when the temperature is changed to 62 degrees. Okay, this is the new temperature. And again, the constant volume in moles is another indication that you're using Gay-Lussac's law. As usual with gas problems, the first thing you should do with any temperatures is make sure that they're in Kelvin. So here we have two temperatures that are in Celsius, so we need to add 273 to both of them uh, to get our T1 and T2 in the proper Kelvin unit. And then we can just analyze it as usual. We're given T1 and P1, and we're also given T2, and then asked to find P2. So we'll have to rearrange Gay-Lussac's law to calculate P2. And at this point, we can also make a prediction the temperature is increasing from 18 to 62 degrees Celsius, and so we'd expect the pressure to increase as well. So we expect a final pressure that should be greater than two atmospheres. We can rearrange it. We've seen this algebra before, so to get P2 on its own, you just multiply both sides by T2, and you end up with this expression. And then you plug in the variables. P1 is given to us as two atmospheres. Uh, T1 was converted to 291 K, uh, T2 was 335 K, and when you plug all these in, the Kelvin unit, of course, will cancel out, leaving you with an atmosphere unit, and the numerical value is 2.3 atmospheres. Another example. In this case, a gas has a pressure of 645 torr at 128 degrees Celsius, so torr is a unit of pressure. Celsius, obviously, is temperature, so these are the initial temperature and pressure. And then it wants to know what is the temperature in Celsius, so we're asked to find the new temperature, T2, if the pressure increases to 824 torr, so this is P2. Okay? And again, V and N remain constant, so we're using Gay-Lussac's law. Start by converting your temperatures to Kelvin. 
128 plus 273 gives you a Kelvin temperature of 401K. Right? So this is 401K. Uh, and then we have everything except for T2. So we're going to need to rearrange uh, Gay-Lussac's law to get T2. Uh, but we can see that the pressure is going up. You're going up from 645 torr to 824 torr. And so you're going to expect the temperature to increase as well. In this case, we're rearranging Gay-Lussac's law by cross-multiplying to get T2 by itself, and we end up with this. Again, if you're not sure about this algebra or you want to see another way to do it, uh, just go back and look at the previous videos. It's there for Charles's law, just with the substitution of volume for pressure. Then once you have the expression, you just substitute in the values that it gives you. So the initial temperature was 401 Kelvin, right? It was 128 Celsius, but you add 273 and you get 401 Kelvin. Uh, the initial pressure was 645 torr. The final pressure, P2, was 824 torr. Uh, that means the torr unit is going to cancel, right? We haven't really used torr units that much in this class, um, but it doesn't really matter because as long as the unit is the same and it cancels out here, you don't really need to know what it is. As long as you know it's a unit of pressure, that's enough, okay? So the torr unit cancels out, leaving us with the Kelvin temperature of 512. But again, it's asking us for Celsius. Many of these questions where you need to find a temperature wants to know the Celsius temperature. So you have to subtract 273 and you get 239 degrees Celsius. When we're talking about gases, there's another relationship between uh, pressure and temperature that's really distinct from Gay-Lussac's law. So it's introduced here and in your textbook in relationship to Gay-Lussac's law, but it should really be thought of as separate from that uh, because it really has to do with how liquids form gases uh, naturally and how the temperature of the liquid affects the pressure of the gas that forms above it. Okay? So this is the concept of vapor pressure. It helps to think in molecular terms to understand this. So a liquid, like any substance, is made up of many different atoms or molecules that have a range of kinetic energies. We can associate the average kinetic energy with the temperature, um, but we have to keep in mind that not every particle has the same energy. So if you look at the surface of a liquid, some of the particles will naturally have enough energy that they can escape from the liquid, right? escape the intermolecular forces holding it in the liquid phase and go into the vapor phase. Okay? So they'll escape the liquid phase into the atmosphere above the liquid uh, and move into the gas phase or what we call the vapor phase. Now in an open container, if you have a liquid in an open container, the molecules will just fly off into the atmosphere and they'll never come back. And so eventually all of that liquid will evaporate. Okay? If you put a glass of water in your room, for instance, and you come back several days later, you'll probably find that most, if not all of it, has evaporated. It's not because it boiled, right? You never actually got it to 100 degrees Celsius in your room, uh, but nevertheless, the gas particles were able to escape into the atmosphere and they never came back, so it evaporated. In a closed container, however, it's a little bit different because the particles can't get away. So you'll still have liquid molecules move into the gas phase, Right? So you'll have a liquid in a closed container and there'll be a little bit of space above the liquid. And so molecules will go from the liquid phase into the gas phase. Uh, but then there'll also be some molecules that go back from the gas phase into the liquid phase. Okay? Uh, at first, if you don't have any gas, the molecules going from the liquid phase to the gas phase will uh, sort of rapidly fill up and accumulate in that space. But eventually, once there's enough of them, there'll be a balance between the molecules going from the liquid to the gas phase or from the gas phase to the liquid phase. And so there'll be no net change in the number of particles in the gas phase. At that point, the accumulated molecules are now forming a vapor with a constant pressure, and we call that the vapor pressure of the liquid. Now, it should be clear that because this depends on uh, molecules having a certain energy to escape the liquid phase, if we give the liquid more energy, then more particles will be able to escape into the gas phase. Okay? So we do that by increasing the temperature. That means that this vapor pressure of a liquid is really temperature dependent. So the higher the temperature of the liquid, the more particles escape into the gas phase and the higher the vapor pressure. Okay? 
Uh, a liquid boils when its vapor pressure becomes equal to the external atmospheric pressure. So you can think of the atmospheric pressure as sort of uh, pushing down on the liquid and keeping the molecules in the liquid phase. And it's only when the molecules of the liquid have enough energy to overcome that pressure that, they, that the liquid begins to boil. Okay? So at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius, okay, this is ice water, liquid water has a vapor pressure of only five millimeters of mercury. Okay? This is a very, very small pressure because not many particles, not many water molecules go into the vapor phase. As you increase the temperature, the vapor pressure increases, as you can see. By the time you get to 50 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is 93 millimeters of mercury. By the time you get to 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is now 760 millimeters of mercury, which equals one atmosphere. Okay? So this is not a coincidence. This defines the boiling point of water. Water boils at 100 degrees because at 100 degrees, the vapor pressure of the water molecules is sufficient to overcome the atmospheric pressure pushing back against them. And this is true of any liquid. The, any liquid will boil when its vapor pressure becomes equal to the ambient atmospheric pressure. But what this also means is that the surrounding atmospheric pressure can change the boiling point. So for instance, at high altitudes, atmospheric pressure is lower than one atmosphere, lower than 760 millimeters of mercury. That means that the boiling point of water at that altitude will be less than 100 degrees Celsius, right? It doesn't need as much energy to overcome the atmospheric pressure because the atmospheric pressure is less. So from our starting point, we can think about uh, regular atmospheric pressure as being 760 millimeters of mercury with a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. This is what we're used to, right? But if we decrease the pressure, say to 752 millimeters of mercury, then the boiling point decreases. Because again, there's less pressure holding the liquid molecules in the liquid phase, and so you don't need to heat it up quite as much to turn it into a gas. If you go all the way down to 270 millimeters of mercury, then the boiling point of water changes to 70 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, you can do the opposite. You can put the liquid into a closed container and pressurize it, add uh, some gas or add something to pressurize the water or the liquid. And then you have a higher ambient or atmospheric pressure, right? Say you have 800 millimeters of mercury pressure. And so now the boiling point is increased and the water can actually get to a, a temperature above 100 degrees without boiling. Okay. If you do it high enough, if you uh, increase the ambient pressure to 10 atmospheres or 7,600 millimeters of mercury, then the water can be heated all the way up to 180 degrees before it begins to boil. Okay. So this is used in pressure cookers and also in laboratory equipment. There's a, an instrument called an autoclave, which uh, pressurizes water and superheats it and is used to clean laboratory equipment with this superheated pressurized water.